Tonight's lecture is astronomy, and it's about the eclipse. It's by a friend of mine, Dr. John Rather, and uh, I condensed six pages down to one page, which I, <laughs> I won't read. But uh, he's an interesting fellow. I won't, don't want it behind me in case something comes. Uh, anyway, he's from Chattanooga. He grew up here in Tennessee. He went to University of Tennessee and graduated from University of Tennessee with uh, high honors in physics and astronomy. He worked at a place called Oak Ridge National Laboratory on the uh, fusion energy system, the, the Bumpy Taurus. He, uh, as a young man, he went west. I had to say that. He, <laughs> he went west, he went to Berkeley and uh, studied astronomy, eventually got his PhD. While there, he worked at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which should be called Lawrence, I think, in honor of the physicist. He, uh, he worked at Kitt Peak in radio astronomy as part of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. He actually developed instruments for studying radio astronomy in the millimeter wavelength region. That's really difficult, kind of cutting edge research. He built an instrument and took it to Kenya. So he may tell us about that. You can hardly wait. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, quite, quite fascinating. Along the way, he's worked for NASA, DOE, uh, a large medical research group. He has uh, nine patents, which means he has no shame. I think that's great. <laughs> nine patents. And since he's retired, he doesn't do much. He's working on, uh, uh, let's see, uh, ways of developing specialized chips for in sort of a solid state physics application, uh, acoustic imaging, ultrasonic imaging for medical applications, uh, clean energy storage, and what I would call is non chemical methodologies for overcoming the tyranny of gravity. So he may be able to, able to tell you about those. So uh, Dr. Rather has agreed to inform us of perspectives on eclipses. And I'm very happy you're here, John. Well, thank you. David? <coughs> yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, after all of that, I'm sure everyone is uh, drowsing off, and so I don't have to say very much. But um, anyway, uh, I appreciate uh, very much the opportunity to talk with you. I don't believe many of you were at the other talk at uh, the uh, Museum of Science and Energy. Stick up your hand if you've heard that talk as well. Okay, so maybe uh, a third of the people. Um, it was a very good talk by a visiting uh, fellow from Florida, and uh, I am trying to engineer this presentation a little bit different from that one um, for those that are repeating. Um, I'm going to have essentially three parts of the presentation. The um, first is uh, a simple tutorial for uh, people who aren't too familiar with total eclipses and trying to explain uh, what they are and why they are important. And uh, secondly, I'll talk for five minutes about the physics of the sun because um, eclipses had a lot to do over a period of more than a hundred years of our developing full understanding of the sun is our nearest star. And of course, in the process of that, we've learned a great deal about all the other stars, uh, about a trillion of them in our galaxy. So um, we'll have uh, then about 10 or 15 minutes uh, of preparatory stuff. And most of the presentation is going to be just five short uh, films of the five total eclipses that I've successfully seen. I won't inflict the first one from 1960 on you. I traveled to Maine, and in the last uh, five or 10 minutes before totality, it was clouded out. And um, this, this is an important lesson because we uh, have a lot of water vapor in the air around here. And as the eclipse proceeds, you get cooler and cooler, obviously, because the sun is uh, disappearing. and. Um, then it plunges suddenly into night uh, when totality comes. And um, it can go, it can cut both ways. Um, if uh, you're unfortunate, then clouds begin to condense like crazy and you better be at a crossroads where you can uh, move over in case you see a cloud is gonna get in the way in the last five minutes. Um, on the other hand, if the clouds are high, um, not necessarily cirrus, but stratus, the cooling can actually freeze them out 
and a couple of my movies you're, you're going to see there um, are challenging. Uh, we're afraid we're not going to see it, and then at the last minute, things begin to clear up. So all of this is a way of saying it's uh, very much a gamble. You're trying to hit a moving target, but um, it's well worth it. And a lot of people have seen, practically everyone has seen a partial eclipse, and they say, ho-hum, well, I've seen an eclipse, and what's the fuss? And, and um, uh, the answer is that it's all the difference in the world uh, because um, the experience of having the sun suddenly disappear altogether and be replaced by a thing that looks like a big eye in the sky with a black pupil and you're surrounded and, and if it's really clear by night you can see a lot of stars and planets but um, more likely uh, in the middle of August and on August 21st at 1.30 in the afternoon central or 2.30 eastern time uh, the uh, uh, eclipse is going to be very high up in the sky and hopefully that will help not have the clouds you see out toward, toward the horizon and if we're uh, blessed by good fortune we'll uh, be able to do well with that. Okay, um, to begin with uh, people have trouble understanding why is the path of an eclipse so narrow and why is it uh, so difficult to be in, the, in that uh, track. Uh, and to understand that, you have to think about our sun, which is huge, it's, it's enormous. It's uh, 700,000 times the volume of our Earth, it's 110 times the diameter of the Earth, and it's 93 million miles away. So uh, 93 million miles is a long way, and the sun looks pretty small in the sky. In fact, if you know angles, it's half a degree in diameter. and uh, you know that from basic geometry, 90 degrees gets you straight up. And so you can think of a, 180 suns uh, piled one after the other to get to the horizon. You're not accustomed to that because you think of it when you sunrise and sunset, things look bigger. And you know how beautiful the rising moon looks. It's called the moon illusion because it, it's a psychological thing that's built into our nature probably for a very long time. And the, the, the fact is that as you grow up and learn to see the world, you tend to see about a 30 degree angle, like looking around, I'm looking around the room right now and I see Jarena Stone over here and then I have to turn over here and I see uh, Eileen Hartley, but I don't see the whole room at once. This is 90 degrees, I'm looking at 30 degrees like this, and you, you, you all do the same thing. So when, when you're presented with something where the, the drama is on 90 degree elevation, then something is different in the psychology of it. You're, when the moon is coming up, it's really no bigger than it is up there, and neither is the sun. It just looks bigger because you're referring it to the smaller angle. So it looks three times bigger than when you're looking up here. So does that make some sense to people? Okay, well, the, the fact is that uh, if you don't believe me, the next time you see a big uh, mo harvest moon rising over there, take a, a paper towel roller and look at it through this so you can ignore everything else and it'll look small. Uh, it, it proves that it's... Uh, uh, psychological thing. Um, anyway, uh, why, is the, why is the shadow of an eclipse pointed? Well, because the, the sun is enormous and it's a long way off, but it's bigger than, than the thing that's causing the eclipse, namely the moon. Now, over here is a globe of our Earth, which is 16 inches in diameter, and to scale on the same scale is our moon right over there on that table. Our moon is 2,160 miles in diameter and our Earth is 7,920 miles in diameter. So the moon is just about one-fourth of the size of the, of the Earth. And the scale distance from the moon to the Earth is just about what I've got here now. It's about 40 feet on this scale. So how, how close is the sun on exactly the same scale? It's three miles that way, and it's about 150 feet in diameter. And uh, so you get a feeling for what we've got. Now, the 
light from the sun then is striking the moon and, and it's causing a shadow this way. Why is it pointed? This is the simplest science experiment that any of you can do. And, and uh, t tomorrow in the middle of the day when the sun is almost straight up, uh, look down on the sidewalk or on a bright surface at your own shadow. And you'll see the shadow of your head, but it'll have a fuzzy border around it. Now, why is that? Well, it's because the sun is not a point source. It's half a degree in diameter. So the light that's coming past your head is uh, seeing a partial eclipse of the sun, you see. And um, OK, if you notice that, and I notice it every time I take a walk every day, um, then the, a very educational thing you can do is take your index finger which when you hold it at arm's length like this and look at it with your own eye, that's about uh, one degree. It's a little more than half a degree. And you can take that and be very careful not to look at the sun directly, but you can hold it up so you just block the sun, shut the other eye or cover it, and, and you'll see you're causing an eclipse of the sun with your finger by doing that. And you can move it to the left and right, and you can have a partial eclipse. OK, well, then you can do the same thing. You can hold your eclipsing finger out here and look down on the surface. And as you bring it close, then you get a big, wide shadow that gets as big as your finger. But as you bring it back more and more like this, you see it develops a narrow line of shadow. And then you get it too far away, and, and it all fuzzes out. So, so you, you get the feeling that the, si the angular size of the source in the sky is what's causing this, this convergence. Um, the the uh, first slide tries to uh, explain this a little bit more. I think we are overdoing it. But, but uh, your, your finger was in here somewhere, and an apple or an orange out 33 feet. Uh, so tens about uh, half a degree. And uh, the Empire State Building at, at 25 miles. The moon at 240,000 miles, or 384,000 kilometers. And the sun at 93 million miles. You see, they all look half a degree in diameter. But they're very, very different things at very, very different distances. OK, now, the um, young lady here uh, is very smart. She's using a, a very dark. Uh, lens uh, to look at this. And any of you who uh, expect to look at the partial phases of the eclipse coming up need to get a, a really good filter. I have here um, two examples of um, filters from uh, Home Depot wel <laughs> welding filters. And you, they're pretty inexpensive, and you can get those. Or if you really want to get fancy and get into it, you can. Uh, go to Sky and Telescope magazine, and there are a lot of uh, advertisements for, for these things. I believe uh, eclipseglasses.com is a good example. And you can get a paper thing that you can put on with a shield around it and, and the dark uh, uh, stuff to, to protect your eyes. Never, never look at the bright part of the sun without protection, because you can burn your eyes. And if you're trying to take pictures with cameras, and I'm going to have quite a bit to say about uh, photography, then, then uh, you, you will burn out the sensor in your camera if you point it at the sun, uh, too. So you, it's obvious that it's too bright, too hot, and you don't ever want to do that. On the other hand, what, what the, the news organs have not communicated well is that during totality, when the sun is completely blocked, then you're missing the whole show if you don't look at it with your uh, best possible vision. And you have to know that this eclipse will last only 2 minutes and 40 seconds right near the, the center line. And in Oak Ridge, it'll last only a few seconds. And um, so that's why you've got to get uh, down to the center. But um, when, when, the, when totality happens, as you'll see in the movies that I'm going to show you, then everybody looks and everybody goes nuts because it's so strange and so unusual from any normal experience that uh, people literally uh, uh, don't quite know how to express it. And I confess that uh, I'm, 
I'm addicted to the eclipse just as much uh, because of the sociological, cultural, and psychological uh, aspects as the scientific. Uh, only the first one I'm going to show you was a scientific um, mission, and the rest of them are for fun. Okay, well, she is uh, obviously not in the cone here, and so she's seeing a partial eclipse. Uh, if the moon happened to be a little bit farther away, which it is sometimes because the orbit of the moon is an ellipse, and it varies from a little bit closer to a little bit farther away, then the shadow doesn't reach the Earth, and she sees an annular eclipse. And I've seen three of those in my life. They, they come more often than the others. Uh, but if things are just so, and she is within the shadow, then she can get the full glory of the, of the eclipse. Now, uh, all of that explained, you understand that the focal dot of that shadow is very narrow. In our case, it's about 80 miles wide. And so from Oak Ridge, you need to go about 40 miles to get on the, on the, enter, uh, the, the middle line. Uh, the surrounding area out here, the penumbra is enormous. And so all of North America will have partial eclipses, getting smaller and smaller bite out of the sun as you go further and further away. Now, why don't you have an eclipse every month when, when you have a new moon? As you know, the moon is going around the Earth, and when it passes the vicinity of the sun, why doesn't it pass right across and we see an eclipse? Well, it's because the orbit of the moon is not exactly in the plane of the Earth's orbit. It's tipped about five degrees with respect to the ecliptic plane. This is the ecliptic plane, which is the plane of the Earth's orbit. And you see how the moon rises up and goes down. And the line here connecting the two points where the orbits cross is called the line of nodes. And here it's the ascending node, and there it's the descending node. And what this means is um, clearly that uh, the, uh, let's say here at uh, one, if it happens to be at the uh, top of the ascending node, you, the, sh the shadow is missing the Earth there. If it happens to be uh, the other extreme, it misses it in the opposite direction. However, if the line of nodes happens to be in the right place, you can have both an eclipse of the sun or of the moon, um, which is a different thing to discuss. A good friend of mine uh, in Knoxville, John Lane, has helped me with a lot of uh, animations. And this is a little nice one to help you understand it a little bit better. You see the moon revolving around the Earth and passing below the Earth's shadow in that case and passing above the Earth again to come around here. Now notice that the Earth is orbiting around the Sun and so the line of nodes is moving with it. And if you're very lucky so that the line of nodes is pointed right at the Sun at the same time the moon arrives at that point, then you have an eclipse here. And I'll run that one more time so you can have another look at it. And there you are. Now notice that the Earth was rotating, the Moon was moving along its orbit, and the Earth was moving around the Sun. So all this motion is going on, and the Earth is moving right now uh, at about 18 uh, miles per second around the Sun. The Earth is rotating at this latitude uh, on the order of 800 miles an hour from west to east, and the Moon is orbiting the Earth once every 29 days. And so you've got those motions of the three bodies, Sun, Earth, and Moon, but uh, astronomers learned a long time ago that uh, the perturbations from the other planets, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, uh, are quite significant. And so before digital computers existed, the uh, analytical equations to describe uh, all of the motions of the Moon took about 26 pages of a equations and some very dedicated astronomers who worked through that to 
uh, predict and analyze eclipses for a thousand or several thousand years in advance and, and uh, ago. Now, when you're very blessed by a fine day with fine weather, uh, no, no water vapor to amount to anything in the sky. When totality happens, you can see the corona is quite large. Uh, it's about five times the diameter of the sun, a couple of degrees at least. And um, they, there will be a, a sunset uh, tendency where you're looking through enough atmosphere so it's outside of the spot. But uh, it, it can be really dark and, and you'll see stars and planets. This particular eclipse, the star Regulus, is going to be very close in, like about there. First magnitude star, it's the brightest star in the constellation of Leo. And um, I expect to see that. Also, the inner planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, and I think Jupiter will be in a good position too. And um, so you'll, you'll see the brighter planets without any trouble and maybe some brighter stars uh, in the other part of the sky. Now, I could go on all night and uh, into several other lectures about this, and so I'm going to skip right over it. But uh, the uh, important thing to realize is that it isn't just a curiosity. It's had uh, very important uh, impacts on human culture for 5,000 years at least. Those of you who've been to uh, England and seen Stonehenge, you know that that was probably the, the first infrastructure project in the history of the world, uh, even uh, 500 years before the pyramids. And uh, it was constructed by some very clever people who evidently had an eclipse club that ran for about 500 years. And they were, <laughs> and they were keeping um, track of all the uh, uh, data on where the moon and sun were relatively, so that they devised ways of, of actually predicting eclipses in advance. And then all of the uh, low-paid workers who'd built Stonehenge were rewarded by this information after the fact. <laughs> but um, the, the interesting thing about England is that it's 55 degrees north. We're only 38 or 39 degrees north here. And so this time of year, midsummer, the sun rises in the northwest and swings across the sky way around to the northeast, I'm sorry, and all the way around to the northwest. And so it's, the sun's in the sky there about 18 hours a day. And so even at the full moon, you can see uh, what, what it's doing with respect to the sun, and you can watch all of this ballet going on. And uh, I'm sure that that's why these hinge monuments like Stonehenge uh, were invented in England, and there were several of them we know now. Uh, most of them were made of wood, and, uh, but what they devised was not only a way of sighting through the structure to see where the sun was going to rise and set on the solstices and, and the uh, uh, equinoxes, but they put 51 holes around uh, this structure called Aubrey holes. And they put pairs of rocks in these holes. And guess what that represented? The, the line of nodes, you see. And, and that, that's, there, there is a 51-year periodicity in this combination of, of things that uh, happened. And uh, they were able to decipher that. And later on, they probably even detected an 18.6 period, too. And all of this is because the ballet of the planets uh, is repetitious, and even though it's complicated, the major perturbations are always there, and, and so you have these uh, so-called eclipse seasons. As time went by, uh, the Greeks uh, knew that the Earth and Moon were spheres by about 400 BC, because every time the, the, there was an eclipse of the Moon by the Sun, by the Earth, I'm sorry, the, when the Moon passed through the Earth's shadow, you can see a curved shadow on the moon, and it didn't take much uh, to uh, fill out the curve and see that, well, we're on the moon looking at the Earth, and Earth looking at the moon, it's the same distance. And so the Earth must be at least four times larger in diameter than the moon, you see. And uh, if the Earth was flat, then you'd expect it to look like the uh, edge of a coin on the moon or something instead of always the same round thing, so the Earth must be a sphere. 
And the same applied to the moon, of course, because uh, after they understood that, they can uh, learn a lot about uh, the, the phases of the moon and so on. And once the um, size of the Earth had been measured by Eratosthenes in 100 AD, then you could get a pretty good estimate of the distance of the moon. And they knew that the sun had to be a heck of a lot further away than that because of the behavior of the shadows and everything. Well, it then got scientific about 400 years ago, and, and uh, all of uh, the stuff that, uh, that has happened since. But 100 years ago, uh, the very first proof of Einstein's general relativity came from an observation of an eclipse of the sun from uh, two points on the Earth. And uh, it was possible to see the, the deflection of the position of the stars behind it by gravity. So that was one of the supreme uh, accomplishments of science of all time. Now, uh, I'm going to stay with the uh, discussion of uh, the science for about three more minutes here. And then I'm going to get on with the movies because we're running out of time already. Um, the uh, sun itself is a wonderful example of controlled fusion. You know, we've been putting billions and billions of dollars into it at ORNL and all the other national labs and around the world for um, uh, 60 years now or more. And uh, we've always known that we were going to solve the problem in the next 10 years, and that's still the case. But, but um, any, anyway, the um, upshot is that it's very, it's very uh, uh, soothing uh, to the conscience to know that controlled fusion is possible and it works perfectly well in every star in the universe. Um, the enormous amount of hydrogen over the core is putting huge pressure, causing huge temperature there, about 10 million degrees in the core. And it diffuses outward. The, the radiation scatters and scatters in here for as much as 10,000 years before it gets up to what's called the convection zone, the, about the last 20%. Um, and then things go faster there. And uh, the transfer of energy out to what appears to be the surface of the sun. It's not really a surface at all. It's a big ball of gas. But uh, physics does strange things with hydrogen uh, at, in those conditions of uh, pressure and temperature. So it looks like a surface. and, and um, that's what we identify with the surface of the sun. Um, the, this, uh, it would be impossible for that fusion reaction to stop. But if it did stop, then uh, you wouldn't know it for 10,000 years because the radiation is still diffusing outward to the surface. The thing that I wanted to point out here is that there is an awful lot of physics to be learned about a star or about the sun just from um, uh, the uh, ability to block out most of what's going on and look at what's going on only in the outermost layers. And that's what eclipses, of course, gave us. And because of that, by the middle of the 19th century, the chromosphere was recognized as this layer here. And it's, it's full of uh, these specules that come up from the surface. Now, if we go to a, a, a picture, this is from NASA's Solar and Heliospheric Observatory spacecraft. That's an actual photograph of the surface of the sun in hydrogen light. And you, by the way, in sky and telescope, you can buy a nice telescope for about $300 that lets you look at this and see how it changes from day to day. But um, the, you have the, the sunspots, which look black and white light, but are these active regions are where the magnetic fields inside the sun are breaking through the surface. And they cause solar flares. And you can see some of the flares out here on the edge. And then the extended magnetic fields from the sun are what cause the corona. But the amazing thing that was determined 100 years ago is that the temperature of the sun is 10 million degrees in the center, decreases to about 11,000 Fahrenheit at the white surface. And then lo and behold, instead of getting colder out here, it gets very hot again. It gets up to uh, over a million degrees, a couple of million degrees. And so it was a major mystery. Why did that happen? And that, that was the uh, question that I was focused on when I took this experiment to Africa. Um, the, the temperature drops, drops, drops down to the base of the photosphere, the white surface 
of the sun and then it begins to increase and then it really takes off right there. Well, I, you could have, uh, as Lyndon Johnson once said, you could have knocked me over with a feather when, when uh, I uh, looked at Science Magazine for this week. And um, here's an article on the generation of solar spicules and alphane waves. And it says here, the origin of the spicules is poorly understood, although they're expected to play a role in heating the million degree corona and associated with alphanic waves that help drive the solar wind. Well, I just finished working for 12 years at um, Oak Ridge National Lab and, and Lawrence Livermore lab and uh, a lot of what we did every day involved alphane waves and, and uh, there it turns out 27 different ways that an ionized gas in, in a magnetic field can uh, generate radiation and uh, so I suspected that was the case and Hannes Alphane visited Berkeley while I was a graduate student there and we talked about it. Well, here we are 60 years later, or uh, 50 anyway, 55, and um, this is from the, see, the June 23rd, 2017 issue of uh, Science. And you see the color scale over here from 2,000 degrees up to 2 million degrees. And you see these patches on the solar surface with the really hot, hot stuff coming up. This is all done with a simulation on a supercomputer like we have at, um, at the lab. So it, it seems to me that we're uh, really finally closing in on the solution to the problem. But what I was trying to tie down in my experiment was whether the, uh, the heating was really highly localized right at the surface or whether it was blurred and, and uh, heating all out through the corona. And the, and the answer uh, is that uh, it is caused here locally, but because of the alphane waves, the heating process propagates upward into the corona. Okay, now, uh, shifting gears completely now, I've got about 30 minutes of uh, short movies, and um, I'll show them in, in this order, the order of the occurrence. The first is of my trip to Kenya, and uh, it was the longest total eclipse of the sun until the year 2150 seven minutes and three seconds. The second one to Montana was just for fun, and it uh, happens to be just about exactly the same length as our eclipse coming up here. Uh, the third one in India was an exotic trip well, with my son, and uh, you'll see that. And uh, then this one is the one I really want you to uh, enjoy because uh, it's the, the thrill of the chase, and you'll uh, understand why. And finally, the one in Guadalupe, uh, which was a middle-scale four-minute eclipse in uh, 1998. Um, one thing that I do want to mention is that the corona is very different for different eclipses. This, this uh, reference here, they show us 10 different eclipses. These three are, are the ones that I have uh, pictures of, but you can see that the extent of the corona is very different um, in those, and that's because the sun has a cycling uh, uh, activity period of 11 years, peaks up, drops to zero, goes to 11 years and comes back. And meanwhile, the polarity, the magnetic poles of the sunspots reverse in time with that. Um, Okay, so the first one then is uh, in Loyangalani, Kenya, and the eclipse path started in South America, went right through the Sahara Desert and then across northern Kenya. The U.S. Science Foundation decided that northern Kenya was the best place to observe it, but interesting sidelight is that the Concorde uh, supersonic jet was just being developed at the time, and there were two prototypes, and they put special windows and whatnot in it, and several friends of mine from Kitt Peak Observatory flew and chased the eclipse for a thousand miles across here. So they had an eclipse that lasted an hour, and they were all saying, oh, I'm hungry, it's dinner time, won't this eclipse ever end? But, but um, um, so um, the, um, what I had to do, uh, it was hard times uh, getting support for stuff like this, and I put together an arrangement with the U.S. Air Force to get me to England and the RAF, the Royal Air Force, to get me to Kenya, and the Kenya Air Force to provide a lorry, a truck, and um, support there. And uh, all of that was uh, new stuff for me. But anyway, we had to get from Nairobi 
up to Las Samas and Mar Marsabit and over to Loyan Galani on what was then Lake Rudolph and is now Lake Turkana. This is a better picture, I guess. Here's uh, Nairobi and very interesting country coming up here. The road ended about here and then it was a dirt track going up here and then I crossed the Chalbi Desert on a practically non-existent road in my Land Rover by myself. <coughs> And then the truck came up a, a week or so later with the equipment they were accustomed to, to getting in there. There were four tribes in that uh, part of the world, and um, each one of them was different. Um, this is a very important wom woman with uh, a lot of uh, decoration. And I brought two examples of that you can look at later. Th these are made with the uh, bones of a dick dick, which is a very small gazelle. And um, the, in the lake is a Nile perch. It's an enormous fish that uh, typical uh, catch is at least 100 pounds. And they, the tribes catch one fish a day and, and feed everyone off it. And hey, by the way, there are lots of crocodiles in the lake too. And so that makes it into an interesting sport. But um, here, here we have the fish bones uh, from a Nile perch. And this particular one is interesting because it's made of missionary beads, which are date from the 19th century. And you'll see that uh, I'll be staying at a Roman Catholic uh, uh, mission that, that's located there. The National Science Foundation shows that uh, because we could get good support at that point. Uh, the boys uh, and girls all went to the uh, mission school. They were all uh, literate and very interested in everything. and. Uh, and uh, we all lectured there and, and uh, had a good time uh, telling them about that. Um, just for reference, this is a pretty good picture of totality during this eclipse. Now these are very primitive old movies. Um, this is 44 years ago, old and I had the state of the art movie camera back then. This, this is a Boileau French camera with the, the very first uh, zoom lens that was available out here and it, it's completely wind up. You, you wound it up like that, and I don't know if you can hear it, but um, it's, it's taking pictures now. And, and so I had to bolt this to the side of my uh, radio telescope. The wind was blowing all the time at Wiggles, and um, I couldn't control the, uh, the exposure very well. In those days, you had to do all of your exposures with a, a, a meter like this and uh, adjust things on the run, but I was supposed to be observing the eclipse scientifically, and so you'll have to forgive all of the primitive stuff. It's eight millimeter film, and we've added a little bit of sound from uh, uh, recordings that I made while I was there. That was the calibration telescope that I built on, on the roof of that building. And I realized that it could make these observations uh, for the eclipse. It weighs about 1,000 pounds. And here we are leaving downtown Tucson, Arizona, and going to the US Air Force Base um, at Tucson, Davis Monson. That's my son, Rick, up there, who is now only 52 years old. <laughs> And this was one, another amazing coincidence. Uh, we didn't plan it this way at all, but uh, you can see that it was perfectly sized to fit through the... <laughs> <laughs> this was a U.S. Air Force uh, KC-135 refueling aircraft, and they're still flying them. You can see them over at McGee Tyson. Uh, and it was 115 degrees when we took off for Tucson. We rolled and rolled and rolled and finally got off the ground. And, uh, flew uh, overnight to Milden Hall, England, and here we are landing in England. And uh, we were met there by the uh, lorry from the RAF and taken over to the uh, uh, other airport at Lynham. And those, those uh, KC-130s there, that one that was sitting out there, took the uh, experiment. I had to fly separately because that was a uh, training flight. And you can see the uh, uh, 747 landing there in Nairobi. And this is where I stayed in Nairobi back in uh, 1973. 
I went north in this Land Rover, and it's beautiful country, uh, made amazingly verdant country, and you can see the native huts and the flowering trees. Right on the equator, a man was carving those giraffes. I've got one sitting at the table there that you can look at later. And this is the good road. Uh, this was after the pavement ended, and we were going north toward uh, Lysamis. And there's some zebras and giraffes. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, domestic cattle there. Up in the desert, uh, that's a camel caravan there. And I stopped to take this picture uh, then, uh, oh, I believe we got the speaker now. Those are storks out in the in the mirage, and that gravel that you saw there is the road. I eventually got uh, to Lion Galani on the second day, and there, this is the mission. the father. That's a Nile perch, two of them in fact. And the, the uh, Kenyan Air Force built these pavilions uh, for the astronomers. This was bumping along through where the natives lived. And that's my experiment site right there. You can see the, the Land Rover next to it. The men would chant like this while they were moving it. They have to lift a thousand pounds and that helps. tent. I'd camped with my kids then for several years, but it was torn up in a day or two by the wind. It blew all the time at about 20 miles an hour. Here are the women selling those necklaces, and that's where I bought the two that are on the table from them. A couple of little boys. And there's another of those storks. It's the ugliest thing you ever saw. <laughs> now these, these men had never heard themselves recorded and I had that little recorder and now they're listening to themselves for the first time. There are four different tribes represented here. El Molo, Rindilla, Turkana, and Samburu. And each one of them, uh, you can recognize the different facial characteristics. And there I've got it working finally. Uh, the black uh, plastic protects the uh, reflector. You can see right through it with the radio waves. And you can see the wind blowing. That's an early version of me there with the beard. <laughs> and that's Peter Aid from uh, England who uh, was a student who worked with me in Tucson and helped a lot uh, arranging all the English part of this. <laughs> That's uh, Richard and Meve Leakey, the famous anthropologists who had come to see it. And Jay Pasikoff there has seen more eclipses than anybody. I think he's been to about 40 of them by now. That's the fellow who represented the National Science Foundation there. And this was a colonel from the uh, Kenyan government who was there to make the, make the site official. And that's the president of Cornell, Dr. Corson. And there's our site again. This is another group from uh, Kitt Peak Observatory with their experiment. Th that was flown in. There was a little airstrip there. And a lot of the people were able to come in with the lighter loads uh, by air. My uh, detector had to be cooled with liquid helium. So I got uh, 35 liters of liquid helium out there in the 
desert and kept it there for five weeks and uh, it all worked, <laughs> which is a miracle. Um, and here, uh, Peter Aid is adjusting the uh, electronics. You can see here's a scan across the sun right there before the eclipse began. And what we do is wait until that's blocked out and then see what's left over. And somebody clued together a telescope so you could see the progress of the partial eclipse. Now, remember I had that camera just strapped to the side of the telescope and you can see the wind blowing it around. It That doesn't bother the, uh, the uh, radio detection at all, but it uh, makes for a, a disappointing image of the sun here, but you, you kind of get the message. And I had no, no time to really adjust the uh, exposure And I was so busy, uh, I was just half nuts uh, wor working the thing at the time. Didn't, didn't have time to fully appreciate the beauty of it. But interestingly, um, there was this very peculiar looking uh, camera with a peculiar looking group of people working it. And it, it was the very first IMAX uh, camera and they were there to cover this eclipse. So in the very first IMAX uh, picture ever made, I was in it unexpectedly. <laughs> and there I'm thanking the fellow who uh, had the trucking company that moved everything uh, in and out uh, slowly across the desert on the trucks. Here we are packing up. This uh, uh, Rendella fellow had seen us taking so many pictures he made his own camera and took some pictures of us. And Peter and I are on our way back down to uh, Nairobi there, and we encountered an elephant herd uh, moving along. There were at least 40 or 50 element, uh, elephants moving uh, through there. And here was a baboon that I had to stop and photograph, and he really didn't like it, and he's up there barking at me when he started sounding like he really meant it, uh, we took off and we finally got to a paved road and uh, the, the Land Rover dropped its uh, <laughs> tie rod and uh, Peter and I were wondering what to do and a nice uh, Englishman came along and said, well, you're only five miles from a really nice resort hotel by a waterfall. And um, so we went there and he took care of the Land Rover and then eventually we uh, unwound it all and that was the end of that. So that was uh, my first uh, real exper experience with the uh, 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 eclipse experience. Now the second uh, was totally different. Uh, six years later I couldn't have conceived of the time that I would be involved in a midlife crisis at the age of what 39 by then and uh, so uh, I'm in Montana, we went on a ski trip. Well, we left Washington, D.C. Uh, there were 24 inches of snow on the ground from a blizzard and we dug out, flew to Montana to a ski resort and then drove, got up real early and drove about four hours to central Montana to get to this uh, place right on the eclipse path. And uh, it's my son, Rick, who was then 15 and a woman named Jane and uh, me and we encountered another fellow who will introduce himself at the end. Um, that eclipse nicked across the uh, top of the United States and we, we were uh, right here in Montana and then it took off across Hudson Bay and ended up in, uh, in uh, Greenland. So it was kind of a glancing uh, trip across. And you'll hear reference in this and in the next uh, movie, the one in Hawaii, quite a bit will be said about the prominences on the edge of the sun. And this is what I was talking about previously. The magnetic field of the sun comes up and down and when you, when you get a sort of breakdown in the field structure, it accelerates uh, solar flares outward. It's beautiful to see. The colors are very vivid, much more so than you can get in any photograph. This is a first sound movie for eight millimeters, super eight millimeter. Those are the, the uh, white there is, is the Rocky Mountains. 
See the shadow here? Notice the clouds look pretty bad, but they're freezing out rapidly. See the shadow moving off her. Okay, well, I think there's some evidence that Jane liked eclipses, but, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, so um, it, anyway, Rick did too, and um, so uh, one year later, uh, a lot had changed uh, for a variety of reasons, and I'd moved to uh, Washington, D.C., and um, uh, Rick and I, as I said, uh, uh, we, we had already been there for this eclipse, but uh, we decided to go chasing an eclipse in India the next year. And um, this was exact, uh, just about one year to the day after the one in Montana. And so uh, this is a fairly short movie here. I'll show it um, too. Um, it, that eclipse did pass across uh, the jungles of Africa and clipped southern Kenya there, but we elected to see it instead in, in uh, central India, south of Hyderabad, which was a better site. And uh, that was February 16th, 1980. Here's a snake charmer with the cobra here in front. Uh, we toured India quite a bit, both before and after the eclipse, and here we are in Jaipur. That's uh, me and Rick up there on the elephant. And that's that's a, an eclipse view of the, from the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Maharaja's palace up on top of the little mountain there. All of that is inlaid marble. You couldn't believe it. And the next room you see um, has, uh, not that one, but the one after this, I think, uh, has about 10,000 little convex mirrors in the dome of the room. And they, they, shut, they closed the shutters and lit one candle, and so it made a sky full of stars. And the next shipment of people coming up on their elephants. <coughs> and here we are leaving Jaipur.
Jaipur is in northwest India in Rajasthan. Now we're in central India, south of Hyderabad, and we're bumping along in an old bus, about a 150-mile ride. And everywhere we stopped, uh, people were crowded. They knew that uh, the Americans, the scientists, were coming to uh, look there. The bus had a big rubber bulb with a, a trumpet horn on it about three feet long, and every time anything got in the way, he would honk with it like that. And this is the uh, place uh, that was chosen for, for the observations, and all the local dignitaries were there. And unfortunately, this is where the primitive sound camera that I had, uh, the sound began to fail. Have you looked all your life? Have you ever seen an eclipse before? This is the first one. It's going to be another one in 1995. You'll be a big girl then. How old will you be in 1995? And you, you can't really hear the ex exclamations during totality here, but obviously the exposure is always wrong in my pictures of the total eclipse, though, because <laughs> I never could get it right, but you can tell that it's there anyway. The sun was not particularly active at that uh, stage, it, and uh, so it didn't have the sculptured uh, corona that you see in, in uh, other phases. And that's the end of it. You can hear people cheering a little in the background. And then we went down to Bangalore, which was the uh, uh, colonial capital uh, that the uh, Brits put in there for a couple of hundred years. This is a beautiful old hotel with the uh, high ceilings and the mosquito nets on the bed. And at five o'clock in the morning, I woke Rick up and w we looked out through an arch and saw the Southern Cross and uh, Alpha Centauri beautifully framed by it. Then we went up to Agra, of course, to see the, the Taj Mahal. Look at how small the people are up there on the on the balcony, you get some feeling for the scale of the place. It took 20,000 men 23 years to build the Taj Mahal, and the whole thing is, uh, is inlaid marble. After that, we went to Nepal, and this is near Kathmandu. Um, it's a little uh, town that had uh, lots and lots of temples. You, you can see uh, the peak right up there of Annapurna, which is the third highest mountain there. And um, oh, here are the temples. The blue flashes are because somebody insisted on putting my camera through a, an x-ray machine. Uh, and uh, it's a wonder anything survived. Uh, up there in the uh, country around, the, uh, around Kathmandu, they are making carpets or rugs, and uh, they do it from the sheep onward. They, they shear the sheep, and here the, the women are making the, the fibers and putting them on spindles. And here there are about uh, 50 women in a row down all of the rugs, and they're passing the shuttles back and forth to make the rugs. And uh, they were singing as they did it. And this is the daycare center right outside the building. And that's looking over at uh, uh, one of the other peaks. This is Mount Everest here. Kanchenjunga was the other peak there. And so that's the end of uh, the Indian uh, adventure. Now, the next one is the one that I think uh, I like the best of all of them. Uh, it's um, the Hawaii eclipse of July 11th, 1991. And uh, this really gives you the feeling for the, the thrill of the hunt. Um, 
it uh, began here in Hawaii near the Big Island, the west coast of the Big Island, and then swept down through the jungle to South America. It clipped through Mexico a little bit there. And it was a beautiful eclipse. This is really an excellent picture of it. And you can see the prominences on the top and bottom. You're going to hear people ex exclaiming about that. But uh, the uh, video camera that I used to take these pictures was this uh, little thing here. It was uh, the very first uh, home video that, that we had. And so uh, I, I was doing this, uh, trying to get the pictures that you're about to see on a boat. <laughs> And there is a, a different exposure uh, bringing out the uh, prominences, but it's sacrificing the, the inner corona. OK, Dana is my second daughter. And uh, the Nottages are her in-laws. Sam is her husband. And uh, you'll see all of them in this movie. We're west of the big island off Kona. And here's my dear wife, Ruth, uh, trying not to be seasick. <laughs> See, it's not very promising at this point. <laughs> You see the spot of light on the water over there. We're trying to get to that because we know the sun is shining there. The clouds helped out with the photography because you can easily see the partially eclipsed sun there. making for that hole, but I don't know if we can get there in time. It's about uh, seven minutes to go to the totality. Less than five minutes to go now, and it doesn't look very good. getting very, very dark over behind us. That's the shadow coming, of course. Sunset colors in the sky. Up there is a little blue, but we're not in the right place to take advantage of it. Steer left a little, Sam. Time compresses, and you, you just can't determine how fast 
this seems to be going when it's happening. Okay, here, here's, here's Diamond Ring. Bailey's beads. There's the Corona. how the clouds are freezing and so they get better remarkably fast by the end of the eclipse we really have a good view can you see some prominences i don't see any i can see them get the binoculars orange Prominences. See, see the orange prominences. Beautiful. Yeah. Right, right at the top. Be sure that Ruth sees that. You can barely tell the prominences are there on top and on bottom, but uh, this camera wasn't sensitive to red light, and so we just don't show. Look at that prominence at the top. You see that? Stop the boat, that's good. Yeah, quiet. No, we should have quiet now. Let's kill it. Let's quiet. Yeah, kill it quick. Yeah. What's the red on top? That's a prominence. A flare. No, that's a flare. A sun flare, solar flare. See, we should have brought a camera. Stop the engine. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Ah, oh, that prominence is huge. Yeah. And look at the appearance of everything. Now we're getting close to the end. What time is it? Um, We've got about one more minute, I think. It's just bright, bright, bright gold at the top. That's a prominence. Right. See, that's hydrogen light. This one. Very hard to hold the camera still in the swell here. Look at that flare. Isn't it beautiful? And you can see this. See how the magnetic field of the sun is making the streamers in the in the in the corona. Yeah. You could really see the fine structure of the of the streamers. It's just too bad that it doesn't show. Yeah. Isn't that something? Let me stop it down here a minute and see if I can. Stop well, you that? can see the streamers a little bit better there. I'll tell you, you when it's not safe. Okay, here's the diamond ring. Okay, look away and pretty soon. Just just glance at it now. Don't don't look more. The diamond ring happens when the sun shines between the peaks of mountains on the moon. It's the first glimpse of the of the sun you get. That was great. That was so neat. <laughs> well, that's because the light. I'll let this run just a couple of minutes more because it's interesting. Actually, just at the right time. Yeah, it, it was just so right. It could have been better. Those high clouds could have been gone, but we could still see just. Yeah, well, we. You know, when the diamond ring came out, it made a perfect, beautiful. You, you could see the light expand around the sun. It. It so it's my daughter Dana with her filters on her head. <laughs> and I thought it was simply beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. Because the diamond is at the top of the ring. Yeah. <laughs> But that uh, prominence, that solar flare, oh, was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, Is it okay to walk water. on the roof? Yes. Oh, yes. It was just like a hole in the sky for a while. Yeah. 
Then the, 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 yeah, under, the red thing and the diamond. Yeah, yeah, the oh, oh, the camera is still there. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, Model the Eclipse fashions. Wonderful. Very nice. Very nice. There, I'll make it come on faster. Corbell. What, How do you know like it? Do you know? Right. That is exciting. <laughs> I'll copy that yeah. tape. Oh, okay. Shall I pop it or should I? Pop it. I'll launch it. Yeah. Here, this, oh. is, this is yours, Ruth. Oh, well. Sorry. Oh. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Here, let me congratulate you. Give me your hand. Let me there we go. You. All right. <laughs> Great deal. Oh, my Here's the famous astronomer, Dr. John Rather, and his lovely wife, Ruth, here in Hawaii for an incredible solar eclipse experience, which we have now completed successfully. Now we're prepared to go get incredibly bombed on Corona beers and catch the biggest fish that either one of them has ever seen before. Let the fishing begin. Zoom in on Ruth. Okay, Ruth? Johnny, hasn't this been the most merry and beautiful and glorious and celebratory and friendly vacation? It's been awful, simply awful. It's been so <laughs> Okay, that's that. Um, that was really a, a great experience and uh, uh, lovely people. We had a grand time. That eclipse passed directly over the top of Mauna Kea, where the biggest telescopes in the world were located. And they had perfect weather up at the top of the mountain. All the clouds were below. So uh, it was just amazing. The next one is short. Um, the last one is in Guadeloupe in 98. It's an island in the French West Indies down near Trinidad. Um, and uh, you can see that we were located right about there. And it's, it's a very, very pleasant place. Uh, I would recommend it to anybody. Uh, there are two islands joined together by an isthmus and uh, the one in the distance there is an active volcano. You can see it smoking a little bit. Right there is the smoke coming up from it. And this was at our hotel. <coughs> it's a French island of course and I was trying to get a picture of Ruth uh, enjoying it here. Um, uh, the camera, I wasn't controlling it very accurately and it, 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 it drifted up a little bit. But, uh, but, uh, uh, And wonderful fish. There, you got the whole fish, charcoal. You know, it's just beautiful stuff. And uh, we were in a little town there on the way to where we watched the eclipse, and people were getting set up all over the place there. But we elected to go on about another ten miles uh, up in the country. And these people were having a party right across the street from where we stopped and uh, pretty soon they invited us to join them. So. Okay, the eclipse is in progress. We found a location. Next uh, soccer field here. Different ones here. Yeah.
Oh, get a little beach uh -huh. scene here. Wonderful. Excellent. It's okay. I wish I'd remembered to set the clock in this camera. It says uh, 224 and it's actually about 218. 217 actually. Listen to the chickens. Yeah, you can hear the uh, rooster. It's getting pretty dark. You don't, since the camera is adapting, you don't know how dark it's getting. But it's still partial, of course. Yeah. The light is getting distinctly fainter now, but of course the camera is accommodating to that, and so you won't see it too much in the pictures unless I play games with it. I think I'd rather leave it on automatic, though. And the shadows will be sharpening up. Let's go see if we can see all of the little images of the sun on the ground or little crescents. Can you see them? Yeah, I thought it was from the leaves. The, 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 little, the little pinhole images of the sun are all crescents. Every little image is a crescent. Okay, we're getting to the time where it's going to happen in a hurry now. Just a few more minutes. Wait a minute, it's this last minute. It always seems like a long time. The shadow's coming. See the shadow on the clouds? Look over here to your right. See the shadow coming to your right? The darkening in the sky, see? Okay. That's a cloud there that's catching the light and it's a little bit overexposed. Here it comes. Okay. Almost. Wait a minute. Don't look. Don't look. Not yet. Okay, here we go. It's getting close. Not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Okay, here it is. Watch the diamond ring now. Wait a minute. No, wait, 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 dear. Don't look until I say. I'm trying to keep it in the camera here. Yeah. Okay. There it is. Did, did you did you, did you say Venus? Venus? Oh, Mercury. oh, Jupiter, it was, yeah, Mer yeah Mercury. Mercury and Jupiter. Pluto and Mercury. Yeah. Oh, I can't get the darned exposure on Oh, it's beautiful. Just look at it with your eye. Listen carefully to what Ruth said. Oh, that was a really glorious experience, wasn't it? It was the best experience I've had in a long time. Yeah. Anywhere. It was just so spontaneous and perfect. Good job. Yeah. I'm watching. <laughs> I got my driver's instructions there. Um, well, that's, that's all of the movies I have. Uh, the uh, final slide uh, is about the Tennessee situation and no one can predict. 
Uh, we know that it's passing all the way across the United States and that it's maximum right here in Roan County. Uh, and the spot is about this size. Um, you can see Chattanooga here. And let me get out where I can see a little better. Uh, here's Knoxville over here, kind of equidistant outside of the spot. Dayton and Spring, Spring City is smack on the middle. Um, what I'm going to do is go, Oak Ridge, by the way, doesn't show, but it's right here, right on the edge. And we're going to go to Kingston and then probably down to the road that comes across Watts Bar Dam right in this area. Here we'll be at a crossroads where if clouds come at the last minute, we can take off in four different directions to, to try to get to the spot. So that's, that's what eclipses are like. Thank you. <laughs> As soon as the diamond ring is uh, essentially over with, I mean, when, when it's getting very dark and the diamond ring is practically gone, then you remove your glasses and look at the corona, look at everything. And as soon as the diamond ring comes back at the end of the eclipse, then you immediately go back to the dark glasses again. And never, ever look at the white uh, body of the sun because it's, uh, it's just as hot in that little piece as it is in the whole surface and it, it can burn the retina of the eye, so, so you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. What kind of lens do you have or filter do you have over your lens? Uh, to take pictures of the partial phase, uh, I um, use these, these same uh, uh, welder's filters here and um, I, I like this little <laughs> camera here for a bunch of reasons. It has a 10, uh, 10 power zoom on it and uh, you can easily tape a piece over here, just take a piece of duct tape to hold it in place. So during the, the partial phases you can, can do that. I didn't um, talk about the, the graduation of, of different cameras. Th this one uh, was used in, in Kenya, I, I'm sorry, in, uh, in India. And um, no, I'm wrong. That, that was still the eight millimeter uh, Super 8 sound camera. Then th this one uh, was used in the following eclipse after that, I guess. Um, Wouldn't that be Hawaii? No, Hawaii was the big one. I've got it now. Th this was the one after that. Of course, they're getting smaller. So by 1998, it was down to this size. And um, it, one very important thing to get good pictures of the eclipse, it's absolutely necessary to have a tripod. And you want to be able to pan it uh, have a control so you can lock it in. I am obviously not a very good photographer. Uh, there's a really good one sitting right up there. Fat Postma wins prizes all the time for. <laughs> but the the uh, film uh, film has very limited dynamic range, and the electronic cameras have much wider dynamic range. But unfortunately, most of them are equipped so that they adjust. You know, as the light is going down, uh, they, they accommodate it. And so you can't really tell the difference uh, very well. But this camera has a lot of override options. And, and uh, if I only knew how to uh, optimize better, maybe I'd get better pictures. But it's, uh, I've never really seen any picture in any medium whatsoever that can capture the beauty of the, of the whole experience. It's such a global experience and uh, so much of it is uh, your own perceptions, you know, and you can remember things that you can never get uh, in a flat uh, film, but, um, but you can keep trying. One of the best re uh, renderings I've ever seen was um, in the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's a uh, oil painting about yay big uh, from the 19th century and uh, the, the artist really captured the the gradation of the sky and so on. It, it, um, it, as it's getting near totality, the sky gets kind of a deep uh, slate gray, uh, purplish, and uh, 
depending on the clouds and all the rest, of course, it's different every time. But um, but uh, you never you never know quite what you're going to get. And since since this is a, a fairly short eclipse, um, the the spot is smaller than you would like. Uh, then you're going to have quite a bit of sunset around, and I expect there'll be quite a bit of light in the sky. But uh, during totality, if it's clear, we certainly should see the planets and and probably Regulus. Uh, star very near the sun and maybe some other stars. John, mm -hmm. uh, welder's lenses come in different grades or shades. Do you know what shade? Do you have any yes, shades? both of these, if you look obliquely carefully, it says uh, M10 and 11, M10-11. And these are perfectly safe. They're pretty dark, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Folks, I'll leave out, I have two announcements. My lovely, no, not my lovely assistant. John has a, <laughs> John is wearing a beautiful shirt that he Watch designed. Watch it, then. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he has a box of them. It's like the author showing up. Well, I just happen to have a couple of books yeah. that I've written. Right. But well, these, this uh, is for real. I'm going to get one. I blushingly you. admit that this is true. There's a whole <laughs> whole box of the uh, approved. Uh, best uh, Eclipse T-shirt in the history of the world, and uh, uh, they, they, they were. <laughs> yeah. So he is yeah. he is selling them. Yeah. The other you, announcement, you, final yeah. one, John. You, tell you what, before you before it goes into shirt time, I'm going to tell you this is not a purse. This is a carrier of the Orion Cup, <laughs> and each of our Orion speakers gets an Orion Cup. So, John, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, I'll toast all of you with it. <laughs>